So we're here with Mr. David Gao, former European business edi editor for The Guardian. Um, I just wanted to start off on a question um, relating to something you mentioned at the end of uh, your lecture mm. in response to one of the questions. Um, it was in reference to um, the Barclays... Uh, fiasco that uh, you suggested that, that some journalists exposed about them trying to sort of avoid taxes. Um, how important do you think it is that journalists do sort of act as these checks and balances towards sort of large corporations and act as watchdogs almost? Uh, well, I think it's absolutely part of their it's part of their key role. It's a key essential role that uh, if journalists are going to act as uh, as, as part of the, you know, it's part of the kind of democratic um, accountability regime, if you want to call it. I mean, it's a bit far-fetched, a bit far a bit sort of highfalutin, perhaps. But, but uh, nevertheless, I think it's absolutely important that they do hold people to account. And this is not just true of um, a uh, banks or big corporations. It's true of governments. It could be true of charities. It could be true of. It can be true of all sorts of bodies which set themselves up and which claim to act in a certain kind of way. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that the exposure of um, hypocrisy and wrongdoing is a very central element of journalism. I'd like to ask a question that a few days ago you wrote on The Guardian that EU suspended aid designed to support the EU's poor regions to Hungary because the Magyar government broke EU budget rules. Do you think that such a measure should be also taken in cases of clear limitation of freedom of expression, considering that Orban government was several times accused to do so and only partially respected the advice is given by the EU? Well, I mean, this is, I think this came up in the conversations we had, the discussions we had. Quite clearly, the, 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 the bar is set quite high, or should be set quite high, in terms of these political criteria, the, known as the Copenhagen criteria for entry to the EU. And if countries breach those rules, then I think at the very least they should be exposed, they should be named and shamed, and if necessary with repeated breaches, yes, they should be expelled or temporarily suspended until they change the rules governing those behaviours. Because there's no point in sort of demanding entry criteria and then, then when a uh, you know when a country breaks those very criteria and let, letting them get away with it it makes a mockery of the whole thing either you stand for a set of values or you don't and that means if you stand for a set of values then those values have got to be enforced and seem to be enforced uh, considering that press freedom was one of the main criteria to access to EU and the lack of homoge homogeneity among the 27 member states how do you think the EU should face this issue uh, well, this is very difficult because you're going to find it extremely because the, the you know the press relations, press ownership, everything varies an awful lot between countries. There is no single uh, model of uh, you know of of um, press ownership or, or or even kind of press development or even even agreement about the kind of role of role of journalists actually. So, I, I mean, again, I think you have to set certain criteria there, and if countries break these these kind of almost like basic rules of behaviour, basic rules of engagement, they should be held to account. After all, if you could do the same for breaching the um, uh, budget deficits, as we talked about, why can't you have similar rules for human rights or for freedom, those kind of personal freedoms which we've been talking about? Fair enough. As someone who has, who has the perspective of both working in a prestigious British newspaper, such as The Guardian, and as a correspondent abroad, do you think that the paper media has lost its way and is now too caught up in tabloid press and scaremongering, especially when there are now more efficient ways of getting news to the people? Do you think that this is more profound in Britain than elsewhere? And what do you think can be done to turn this reputation around? Ooh la la. <laughs> well, I mean, I certainly think that uh, there are fewer and fewer foreign correspondents. That's certainly the case, because foreign, cor foreign correspondents cost a lot of money. And, you know, when the uh, business itself, particularly in the West, is under, you know, the economic tosh, it's extremely difficult. Uh, I don't share the view that they are just sort of becoming tabloids or only interested in tabloid stories. Of course, there's a tendency towards, you know, tittle-tattle or, you know, uh, the latest sort of... Uh, piece about who's screwing whom, frankly, uh, you know, which is of no great interest to anybody, I don't think. Of course there's that tendency, 
but um, how are they going to turn it around? I mean, that's a huge question. I mean, the print media, I think, I said here upstairs, I think uh, certain newspapers, I will be very surprised if they are carry on being produced in the form in which they've been produced before. Uh, I can well envisage that even before I'm dead and gone, uh, you know, that The Guardian, for example, may no longer exist as, as, in, in the form it's existed since 1821, I think it is, you know. Um, but the economics have to be rethought. That's absolutely correct. Where, we, where it'll end up, I couldn't tell you now. Um, so do you think that with the rise of sort of every person being able to act as a sort of journalist for the, the stories that they find important. Do you think that there is a risk of a lack of professionalism entering into the profession? Well, they're not professionals. I mean, the citizen journalist is not a professional person. The citizen journalist is a citizen putting up his or her views and, and ideas. Some of, it is a, some of it is very useful. I mean, some of it is incredibly important. You know, we would not have known uh, about the uh, reaction to the kind of completely appallingly rigged elections in, in, in Iran in June. We would have known half the stuff which has been going on in the Arab street. Not just there, elsewhere too. A lot of this stuff, of course it's very fast. But I mean, it's not a question, I mean, it's not a question of treating them as professional, they're not. I mean, I question whether a blogger actually is a journalist. Mm -hmm. I mean, any old fool can blog. Frankly, Although but not everybody. But not everybody blogs. can write a story. Maybe some journalists can't blog. Hey, you're, you're right. I mean, I've had to learn to do all of this. Mm -hmm. You know, even after I retired. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if I could do it, why can't everybody else? Yeah. You know. Um, but do you think that that does sort of pave the way for, for a blurring of the lines? Well, clearly. I mean, that's why I was talking about what I was talking about upstairs, which is the deprofessionalisation mm -hmm. of the fourth estate. Um, yes. Quite clearly, I think that's a very, very uh, current and, and growing, growing danger. There is a threat to, to the profession, but it's not just coming from citizen quote citizen journalists. It's coming from the economics of the business. It's coming from, you know, the financial crisis, the economic crisis, te technological change itself. You know, um, that is none of this can be over. It's, it's the combination of at least three or four different forces, all at the same time, which is making it so difficult to sort of. For, you know, journalist is a profession to hold its head above water. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, well, thank you very much for your time. It's no, been brilliant all. talking to okay, you. Okay, all right. Take care. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. I'm just going to go talk to this of course, yes. Dutch colleague. Sorry.